Good day, everyone, and welcome to our Applied Entomology class. This is uh, a class to do a general overview of four orders of insects. And those four orders of insects that we're going to look at are the order Siphonoptera, order Hemiptera, order Pteroptera, and order Malophaga. The other Siphonoptera are the fleas. The other Hemiptera are the bugs. Other Pteroptera are the sucking lice. And the other Malophaga are the biting and chewing lice. We will now go over to discuss generally on these others. In each and every one of them, we will discuss the general characteristics of the order, and then we'll discuss the medical importance and mention some insects of medical importance in those orders. We want to go over to other Siphonoptera. The other Siphonoptera, as earlier mentioned, are the fleas. Generally, they have a characteristics they are small wingless insects, small wingless, they have no wings. They beat complete life cycle. Their bodies are streamlined. They are streamlined and they are uh, laterally flattened. They have some hairs looking shiny, although they vary in color, uh, ranging from yellowish brown and some of them are just like, they are just black. The, these insects in this other Siphonoptera are also parasitic in adult stage. They are parasitic uh, in the sense that they feed on certain hosts, even as an adult. They suck blood of uh, warm-blooded animals we serve as their host. The elongate larva of the Siphonoptera lack eyes and legs, and they have sparse but strong setae. They still have some other general characteristics. Uh, even though the adults are parasitic, but the larvae are normally not parasitic, but they feed on organic matters which they find in the nest or the dwelling place of the hosts. Well, the lovers are also sometimes found on host animals outside the dwelling place, but on the body of the host animals. They can be found in coats of dogs and cats that looks dirty, and even on human beings that doesn't have clean habits, they can also be found on their body and their coats. The pupae of the Saphnapterans is found within a cocoon, and a cocoon is known as a case. It is a silky case that spawned by the larva. By the time the last stage of the larva uh, is uh, the, the final stage of the larva has emerged then and gradually want to go into pupae. They, they, they uh, uh, spawn this cocoon. And this cocoon uh, serves as a protection of the insects, for the insects when the insects finally emerge into a pupae. Now we'll talk about the brief life cycle. There are some important things to note in the life cycle of the Siphonapterans. The life cycle, like we have earlier mentioned, they beat complete metamorphosis. So the life cycle in the life cycle they have four stages. The first is the egg, the second is the larva, the third is the pupa, and then the final stage is the adult. Normally, the complete life cycle usually takes place in the nest. Of or the dwelling place of the host and may last 
between uh, three to four weeks for it to uh, begin from egg to adult stage. And so, a female siphonaptera may produce several hundred eggs or more, several hundreds or more, when they have an environmental temperature that suits them. And if the eggs they lay land in the right places where conditions necessary for their hashing are available for the eggs, they may hash into lava just after five days of the egg laying. The, uh, after two to three weeks, the lava molds twice and it grows and uh, spin a cocoon through its salivary glands. And it's that cocoon that protects the lava stage. The duration of the pupa stage depends on environmental temperature or ambient temperature. And it lasts within one to two weeks. Now, the, when the pupa is there, the adults matures and um, want to emerge from the pupa. When it's ready to emerge, it stays in the pupa waiting for something. What is it waiting for? The pupa stage needs a trigger or a stimulus or a vibration in order to induce it so that the lava, the adult, will flee or will emerge from the cocoon. In fact, if there is no stim uh, stimulation by maybe external force like uh, an intruder or maybe man or animal that enter the dwelling place, the adult may remain in that cocoon for a long period of time. And uh, this is the reason why uh, when a human or an animal or the first person that enters into the dwelling place where that particular pupae is, or where these siphonapterans dwell, the first person to enter that place, uh, if the place has been uninhabited for a long time, may suddenly be attacked by innumerable fleas, several numbers. These are adult fleas that are emerging from the pupa case. So now, that's all we can take about the life cycle. Let's talk about the feeding behavior. Uh, the feeding behavior of the siphonaptoran. For the lovers, blood is a nutritional requirement of several species of siphonaptoran. So they take blood meal. They take blood meal. And then the blood the lava feeds on, where do they come from? They are supplied by adult fleas, which during feeding, the adult fleas eject feces consisting of remnants of digested food, of digested food of a previous meal taken by the adults. And this is followed by droplets of virtually undigested food. And then the larva will feed on this blood from the adults. Aside that, some larvae even prod the adults a flea and produce fecal blood, which they then suck up. So the larva can get the blood they feed on in two different ways. One, from the uh, blood uh, ejected with feces in the remnant of digested food of adults. That is one way they get the blood they need. Remember that that blood is a nutritional requirement for the lava. The second way they get it is they prod the adult fleas to produce fecal blood, which they then suck up. These are two ways they get the blood. With their shrine and the sucking mouth part, the lava also feed on organic debris present in the nests of the host. And uh, that's all we can take uh, concerning the lavas, then let's talk about the med medical importance of the siphonapterans. The fleas are known to parambulate on the body of the host in large numbers. And so the parabulation of these fleas 
most times very rapid on the skin of the host can cause extreme annoyance and irritation. And this can lead, or uh, uh, it can, when it's aggravated, it can lead to difficulties or detention. And so during, uh, and it can, it's very, very unpleasant experience for the hosts. The after effects or the repeated application of the fleet mouth parts to the body of the skin can even uh, cause itching on the body of the host. Or it can even result to an infection as a result of scratching by the host and opening of wounds on the body. And this is not a pleasant experience. For the cats, following attacks by flea, or such as cat flea, they are for the cat fleas, certain individuals may develop a mental condition. And this mental condition is known as delusory parasitosis. Why? It makes them suffer from an imaginary ectoparasite. Even when the ectoparasite is no longer there, they still feel that they are being attacked by an ectoparasite, which in reality is not there. A jigger known as Tunga penetrans, take notes, Tunga penetrans, mostly found in tropical Africa, uh, is of very medical importance. The female Tunga penetrans attach themselves to the feet of large animals, including man and pigs, being particularly their suitable hosts. And the soft skin between the toes or under the toenails is especially the uh, most favorable place for them to attack. The female uh, Tunga penetrans bury themselves with the head of uh, strongly developed mouth parts under the skin, but the tip of her abdomen remains just outside the surface. So Tunga penetrans is a member of the siphonatran order that is of a very that has a, an important or that is very medical important. When neglected or improperly treated, the jigger lesions often become secondary, inf uh, secondarily infected with other organisms, and sometimes causing loss of digits or even tetanus. I think that's all we can take from the other. Uh, the other siphonaptera. Let's talk briefly on the other hemipterans. The other hemiptera, they are the bugs. And now we talk about their general characteristics. The hemipterans have two pairs of wings. Unlike the siphonopterans that are wingless, hemipterans have two pairs of wings. And they exhibit incomplete metamorphosis. Not complete this time, incomplete metamorphosis. They possess piercing and sucking mouth parts, and the anterior pair of the wings are most often harder than the posterior pair. Remember, they have two pairs of wings. One is anterior, and the other one is posterior. So the anterior parts are most often harder than the posterior pairs of wings. All uh, uh, insects in the other hemiptera, or almost all of them, in all their stages of development, possess sucking mouth parts, except the adult male of Cochidia, which have atrophied mouth parts. Some examples in the other hemiptera, they are the plant box, the assassin box, the bird box, cone nose box, kissing box, and the, the mealy box, amongst others. Remember, they are the orders of box, box. So this is where most of the box belongs to. And majority of them feed on or suck up juices of plants of various kinds, talking about the hemiptera. So those are some things to note about the general characteristics. So we now talk about uh, the suborders, some suborders of hemiptera. 
the suborder Hemipteras, they are in two in number. The first one is Heteroptera, and the second one is Homoptera. Heteroptera, the suborder, includes all species of bugs that are known as true bugs. So all the true bugs are found in the other Heteroptera. And then, in most of the Heteroptera, the name, as the name is suggests, the consistency of the four wings is not uniform. That is hetero. Hetero is not uniform. But the heteroptera fold their wings flat on their back with the apis superimposed on them. The second suborder is homoptera. Homoptera, they include uh, cicadas, the leaf hoppers, frog hoppers, green flies, scale insects, among others. In homoptera, the texture of the four wings is uniform. That's why they are homo, homo, homoptera. They, uh, they are uniform. And the difference in consistency of four and head wings in heteroptera is more evident than in case of homoptera. Then uh, the suborder heteroptera is divided into two. That's the uh, gymnocerata and cryptocerata. Just take note of this. Now we talk about the life cycle. The life cycle of the hemiptera, they have three stages. Incomplete, a life cycle, that is the egg. And the egg, uh, multiple instar lovers, and then the adult, that's at the three stage. The egg and the multiple instar lover, that's the lover stage, and then the adult. The lava form is also known as the nymph or the neonite. And the lava tends to look like a miniature version of the adults. If you uh, keep the lava and keep the adults and you look at them both, uh, you, you see that they look alike somehow. Uh, the lava looks like a, a smaller version of the adult, but they are different. The adult is different and the lava is different. The wings of the immature are not fully formed and appear as wing box. The reproductive structures of the immature are not developed, and the pupa stage is usually absent, like we have mentioned. That's about the life cycle. Then some families of medical importance are the reduvidae and the semicidae. The, there are more than 20 subfamilies, anyway, uh, 20 subfamilies of the reduvidae. This reduvidae is where you have the cone nose box, the kissing box, and the assassin box. The subfamily Tritomine is most important medically and includes those species of which both sexes feed exclusively by sucking the blood of vertebrate animal. Tritomine are popularly known as cone nose box, and they occur in the nest of birds and mammals and in the dwellings of man and his domesticated animals. That's about this family, Reduvidae. And the, the family uh, Simicidae, they are the bed box. The bed box. Members of the Simicidae, they are small, they are oval, those ventrally flattened insects. And the bed box in first habitation of man, they, they live in close uh, association with man. Uh, in unhygienic environments, they infest the habitation of man. Closely related species may also attack birds, and such birds may include pigeon and house martins. As, we are, as, to, as to where they live, bird bugs live in cracks and crevices in structures. Wherever there are cracks, crevices in buildings or similar places, they leave them. They even leave behind wallpaper and in beds and other furnitures. And of course, they approach man when man is sleeping in his beddings. And the purpose they do this is to obtain blood mares. Their eggs are laid in crevices and cracks where the bog live. And uh, if they infest a premises, that premises usually is usually characterized by an order. 
the abiding nuisance are uh, cases of iron deficiency caused by excessive feeding of the bed bugs of infants. On infants have been reported. You see, when they bite, is a nuisance, and it may result in iron deficiency when they feed excessively on uh, young or infants. It has been reported. Okay. Um, that's about the other hemiptera. We don't want to talk about the other pteraptera, known as the sucking lice. The, we'll talk about the general characteristics. Two species of sucking lice the, in the other pteraptera, and this other was uh, formerly known as anoplura. So if you see other anoplura, just know that it's referring to other pteraptera. And so both of them can be used uh, to replace each other. They are parasites of humans. They are mainly heads and body lice. And be, uh, both of them being varieties of one species. Uh, having a pediculus humanis, uh, the first species, and uh, the pubic lice, Pterus pubis. Body and head lice look almost identical, but the head lice remains more or less on the scalp and body lice on the body. So the head lice remains on the scalp, but the body lice remains on the body of humans or including. But in appearance, uh, they somehow look alike. But the head and the body lice are tiny, uh, about one to four mm long, and uh, elongated. They have soft body, light colored, and of course, they are wingless insects. And the both of them is bit incomplete uh, life cycle. They in, uh, is bit incomplete life cycle. Uh, they are dosoventrally flattened with an angular ovoid head. And the head lice lives on the skin among the hair of the patient's head, while body lice live primarily in the clothings of infested persons. But they move to the body occasionally when they want to take a blood meal. The head lice are transmitted among humans by close contacts. When humans have close contacts and one of the humans uh, have uh, bed bugs on their body, when they have close contacts such as hugging or when they share personal items such as their hats, their caps, their scarves or even combs, hair combs, it can transfer through those means from an infected person to uninfected person. Body lice are transmitted also by close contact, the same way as head lice, but those ones are more of by sharing infested clothing. That is how body lice moves from one person to another. And so, the pubic lice occur almost exclusively in pubic or perianal areas, but rarely on eyelashes, eyebrows, or other coarse head areas. That's about the pubic lice. Pubic lice are not active as head lice or body lice. Uh, they're being attached more often to the skin. Pubic lice generally cannot survive more than 24 to 48 hours outside their human host, outside the body of their human host. And therefore, they do not inhabit other household items such as rocks, carpets, or pets, or even our bathrooms. Now, we'll look at the medical importance of the Piratara. Uh, a species, Pediculus humanis, otherwise known as body louse, is an ectoparasite of several animals, including humans. It is the major vector of three important human diseases, and those diseases are relapsing fever, um, louse-born or epidemic typhus, 
and trench fever. Very important role this pediculous humanist play in these diseases. Relapsing fever, louse bone, or epidemic typhus, and trench fever. A second species is Petrus pubis, that is the crab louse, which has been induced to transmit typhus producing rickettsia to laboratory animals, although it was induced. But however, the body louse is the main vehicle that transmits that disease in nature. Okay, that's the uh, all we can take on medical importance of the Theraptera. Now let's briefly talk about Malophaga. The other uh, Malophaga, the general characteristics, mouth parts of the biting laws are of chewing type. That is, they have a chewing mouth parts, but they are greatly reduced in size. The mouth part is not too big enough. So they are greatly reduced in size and number, and they are difficult to analyze unless you study them intensively. The malophagans are small, generally. They have head, usually broader than long. They have modified chewing and piercing mouth pass. They possess reduced compound eyes. The malophagans has reduced compound eyes. And uh, they have two to five segmented tarsi. Of course, there is no cerci, and the malophagans lack wings. The body of the malophagans is flattened dosoventrally. The body of the malophagans is flattened dosoventrally. The eggs are fastened. The eggs of the malophagans that they lay, they are fastened to the feather. Or the hair of their hosts, either the feathers or the hair of their host. That is where the, the egg are usually found. There is bit incomplete metamorphosis in their life cycle. That's the malophagans. So this is the general characteristics. We'll briefly talk about the medical importance of the malophagans. There is a, a, a species of intrex under this malophaga that will talk about its medical importance. Just take note of it, and that is a Tractodectes latus, a very important species under the malophaga. Once again, the name is Tractodectes latus. It's a species that we need to pay attention to. Uh, is, a transmit, uh, is a transmitter of potential human pathogen. The Tractodetis latus serves as an intermediate host for the dog tapeworm, D. caninum, and is an occasional parasite of human. Both the nymph and the adult stage of Tractodetis latus ingest dead skin, feather, hair, or scabs of their hosts, of their animal hosts. Under high population pressures, the damask skin layer also may be attacked. Thus, the damask skin layer of the host may be attacked. Particularly around wounds, the shoeing lice spend their entire lives on animal hosts like sheep, goats, horses, cattle, and antelope, these are their hosts. These are their hosts. They spend their entire lives on these hosts, and they are the uh, sheep, goats, horses, cattle, and antelopes. And sometimes man comes in between when caring for these animals, when caring for the sheep, the goats, the horses, cattle, and antelopes. These, uh, 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 these uh, insects may infect man under that circumstances. So that's all we are going to talk about. Uh, we have reviewed these four others. That is Siphonaptera, 
uh, Hemiptera, Pteraptera, and Malophaga. So I hope this review will help you to comprehend more uh, other things that we have discussed in the lectures. Thank you.